uh, our final talk this afternoon is by Felicia Sanders, Shorebird Project Manager at South Carolina DNR. And she'll be talking about Port Royal Sound as critical shorebird habitat. So I'll turn it over to Felicia. Um, well, thanks for this opportunity to end the day with some shorebird story. Um, yeah, Felicia Sanders, I work for DNR and work primarily on shorebirds and seabirds uh, across the coast of South Carolina. And for those of you that aren't as enthusiastic about shorebirds as I am, we have a diversity in South Carolina from the large wimbrel, which I'm going to speak about today, to the, to the very tiny least sandpiper. It's the smallest in the world, and it's about the size of a sparrow. And a lot don't know, but we have 52 species of shorebirds in North America and two thirds nest in the Arctic or boreal habitat. So they kind of disappear for a month, month and a half and fly north to this tundra habitat across Canada and Alaska. And uh, I was lucky enough for three summers to spend about a month in Churchill on the west side of the Hudson Bay working with some shorebird researchers. And that place, if you've ever heard of it, is really famous for its polar bears. And there I met Andy Johnson. He was a high school student working on Wimbrel. And this is a Wimbrel nest uh, on the, like I said, on the coast of Hudson Bay, tundra habitat, they lay four eggs. And he was using a very simple trap, a spring trap. Um, and once the bird came back to incubate, you pull a pin that's connected to a fishing line and it springs over the bird to capture it. And this is what he was studying. This is a wimbrel, very robust down curve bill and putting a white band or flag on the bird's legs. And on the back was a tiny tracking device, a geolocator. Unfortunately, you have to recapture these birds to download the data. And they're also not that accurate, about 80 miles accuracy. And so in the red on the map on the left, you can see where Wimbrel nests. They nest uh, on the tundra shores of James Bay and Hudson Bay, Northwest section of Canada and Alaska. And they spend the winter in the blue area on the Northern coast of South America. They spend about six or seven months there and then make some significant stops in the spring coming from the wintering areas to, to their nesting areas. And Andy's research found that the wimbrel that he had banded and tracked from uh, this Churchill area of Hudson Bay, they stopped for about 34 days somewhere on the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, or in the Chesapeake Bay. So it was kind of unknown exactly where these spots were, but exciting to know that these two areas of the Atlantic coast were really important for this spring stopover for this species. And on these spring stopovers, birds often really fatten up and, and get energy to produce eggs and, and even young in the Arctic and uh, just fatten up for the, the next flight north to the Arctic. So kind of switching gears, coming back to South Carolina, and I promise this will have something to do with Port Royal. Um, uh, this is DeVoe Bank. It's a shifting sandbar on the mouth of the North Edisto River. South Carolina DNR owns and manages it, so we frequently go to this spot in the summer and spring. And that's because it has thousands of birds nesting on it. Uh, here are royal and sandwich terns, and it's maybe even more known for the thousands of pelicans that nest on this island. So our team frequently goes there in the summer and the spring, puts up signs. Uh, we count nests, monitor nest success. But we kind of rarely go there in the dark. But over the last 10 years, we we had reason to go to DeVoe and stay until after dark or we arrived in the dark and, and watched the dawn. And we noticed thousands of wimbrel leaving at first light and coming in just at dark 
going to DeVoe in the spring. And uh, nocturnal roosts really aren't very well known because birds often come there in the dark, leave perhaps even in the dark before dawn. So I started expecting that this might be a really important place for Wimbrel in the spring to spend the night. And this was kind of backed up by some uh, our very own Chris Marsh's observations <laughs> and Al Seegers. They also started uh, gathering observations of large flocks of Wimbrel in the spring headed to DeVoe in the evening. And I remember camping one time at Hunting Beach State Park in the spring and also seeing this phenomenon. Thousands of Wimbrel landing on the sandbar and right at dark heading towards perhaps DeVoe Bank. So we, we started having a suspicion that DeVoe Bank might be the site that thousands of Wimbrels spend the night in the spring. And this is really important to understand because unfortunately Wimbrel are really declining. They have declined by two thirds in the last 25 years. And surveys up in the Chesapeake, uh, Delmarva area, which, are, which is the only region they've really done a lot of uh, regular surveys, suggest they're declining by over 4% every single year. So, um, and also the North American population, or it's now considered a species, the Hudsonian uh, Wimbrel, is, is estimated to be 80,000. And the Atlantic flyway population is estimated to be 40,000. So seeing thousands of Wimbrel in one place is really important for the conservation of this species. So I started calling some prominent shorebird scientists in North America saying, I think a place in South Carolina, DeVoe Bank has thousands, maybe 10,000 Wimbrel. And everyone I called just sort of said, Oh, that's nice <laughs> because it was just so phenomenal of a discovery that nobody really believed it. So Andy Johnson, when I met him in Churchill was in high school and now he's a producer at the Cornab Cornell Lab of Ornithology media section. So I gave my old buddy a call and he said, we're coming. That's fantastic. Maybe this is the spot that that geolocator work way back when had identified. So he came down to South Carolina with Matt Aberhard, um, just fantastic, famous Emmy nominated videographer, wildlife uh, producer, wildlife film producer. Uh, he's worked on nature and David Attenborough shows and, and just amazing team. They came down for an entire month in April. And I was amazed by their dedication to get incredible footage, but also just how much they cared about not disturbing the birds. So every single night, late afternoon, they got into blinds or even dug themselves into the sand with all the gear, kind of got ready, set up sound equipment, night vision cameras, and stayed there until after all the birds had left when it was light the next morning. So every single night through rain, uh, some of the equipment got flooded, uh, almost got hyperthermic, but it wasn't just for the shot. It was just to stay still and not disturb these birds as they came in for this night roost. And this is the shot that Matt Aberhard got. Um, really, they documented this phenomenon in South Carolina of thousands and thousands of Wimbrel that are spending the night on DeVoe. Really, without the videography, I'm not sure anybody would have really believed it. So this is not a loop. This is all Wimbrel leaving at one time uh, in the morning in May. Yeah, so most people that look at shorebirds have seen 10, 20 Wimbrel at most at one place. So seeing this many is really phenomenal. Oops. So at the same time in 2019, 2020, 
we got together um, just groups to go out at spring tides in the spring and try to count how many Wimbrel were coming to Devoe. Although we had that incredible footage, we also wanted to try to count how many birds were coming in. Um, and we, we practiced the same kind of consideration for not disturbing the birds. We settled in before dark and then stayed until the next morning if birds were all around us. And we got amazing uh, information and counts on full moon nights. Actually, a few full moon nights, we counted birds with the light of the moon, and we found they came to Devoe much after civil twilight. Even an hour and a half after civil twilight, Wimbrel were still arriving, and uh, we would even count a third of our total after civil twilight in the full moon. And this is what we found. We found that at least 20,000 Wimbrel are spending the night on Devoe during the spring. So probably for a month, every night. Um, this is the largest known nocturnal roost for the species, actually largest known nocturnal roost for Wimbrel in the world. And it's half the Eastern population of Wimbrel and a quarter of the entire now species population. So really incredible. Uh, important discovery so we can work towards conservation of this place. So we've just uh, partnered, DNR's partner with University of South Carolina and Mena Handmaker, PhD graduate student, to try to understand where do all of these Wimble go during the day? We see them leaving right before light and heading out north and south and east and west from Devoe. And uh, we know they eat fiddler crabs. So just her project is to understand where are they going, uh, what kind of, and actually it really ties into a lot of talks we've heard today. What are, um, what are they eating? How is the health of the salt marsh important for the survival of the species? So we've so far put on 12 of these, uh, they're low tech pinpoint GPS trackers. They have a solar panel. They have two antenna. One is communicating with GPS satellite data, and the other one is communicating with a tower that we've erected on Devoe Bank. And this is a, we actually have two towers at Devoe Bank. Um, if you're familiar with the MODIS system, they're very similar. It's uh, two large antennas, uh, guy wires holding it up. And then at the bottom, we have a, a tote with a sandbag to hold it down and a small computer connected to the antennas. And uh, when the birds come back in the spring, they will, the tags will be communicating with this computer and the computer downloads all their location data. So the tags actually will take 100 location points, very accurate all year. So this is, this is gonna be an incredible project about finding out where they're going in South Carolina, but also this data will be collected when they're in South America on their journey to the Arctic and uh, really nobody else has this quality of data for this species, really exciting. And also we only have to download the data from the computer uh, about once a week. So we will not be bothering all the other seabirds and, and shorebirds that are nesting and resting on Devoe. So it, we feel like it's a great system. So kind of preliminary, she's only had uh, one season and we're really excited for the spring when all those birds hopefully come back and we'll get a full year's worth of data. But this is a uh, sort of just the couple weeks that they stayed at DeVoe before they migrated north, their data. Each color is a, a different bird and you can see DeVoe is where they're coming back every night. And they're really spanning out uh, a really pretty far up to um, up to Port Royal Sound. So we're excited to get more tags out and I'm sure there will be a lot more birds that we document that are foraging in the Port Royal Sound. Um, here's kind of just zoomed in. This purple one is the one that foraged all the way near the Marine Corps Air Station. Um, it was, I think, Morgan River and Beaufort River. It foraged every day and then headed back to Devoe at night. 
And this is this is the kind of data these tags are giving. Again, it's 100 points a day. Just um, we find out their route to their foraging area. And interestingly, they're going to the same place every year. We actually put out a couple of tags um, the very first year, and we we got the full migration cycle and found out they foraged in the exact same place the following year. So. These birds are spending the night at DeVoe, but they also have very specific places they're foraging in the day for the entire month they're here and even year after year. So really, really fantastic stuff. Um, excited to see what data they get back next spring. So we've had a lot of great media coverage of this. We have a, a Squarespace website. If you just type in DeVoe, you probably can find it. And we have a great video that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology put together, Andy put together about documenting this roost. Um, we've also had some other media coverage, um, New York Times, Garden and Gun. But I want to mention CBS Sunday Morning. Not only did we have over 5 million people that viewed the show, um, it also includes some of the tracking data that I thought this group might find interesting. And Cornell has made uh, a next video just using the tracking data I just showed you that will be available soon. So we've had a lot of, lot of partners and uh, help funding this. So I just wanna thank all the partners and um, that made this possible. Thanks. All right, thank you, Felicia. Um, so, wimbrels are, as Felicia said, highly dependent upon fiddler crabs, uh, which are a major product of the salt marsh. And uh, this also shows that when we're talking about the significance of Port Royal Sound, that there are species that are highly dependent upon using Port Royal Sound as a feeding area, uh, even though they may not be here year round, uh, it's critical to their life cycle. So um, that was why we thought it'd be great in terms of sharing this story with you. If you hadn't seen the Sunday morning story that brought what 5 million viewers in, it's, a, it's very well done. So put South Carolina at the limelight. A uh, question has popped up uh, that are there concerns of sea level rise and the effects on the roosting area? Any um, comments about that, Felicia? Uh, I'm sure there are concerns, but I'm, I'm not the expert to answer that question. Um, yeah. One yeah of the, sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One one of the one of the advantages of the large scale land protection that's occurred in South Carolina in that area is that uh, it's not bordered by uh, a, a coastal community with seawalls. So in that particular situation, there is space for that sand island to slowly move westward. Uh, as sea level rises. So uh, thanks to where it is on the, and the amount of conservation that's occurred along the South Carolina coast, it may do all right. The question becomes uh, whether the Wimbrel can still be around uh, given all the other uh, impacts on its life cycle, particularly uh, on its wintering grounds where it's hunted and uh, also what changes might occur in the Arctic. Um, what, no, Eric, Monty asks, why do you think they're congregating at Devoe Bank? Um, should this area be protected? Do you use acoustic sensors to detect the birds? So let's break that down as far as why do you think they're congregating there? And any note, information you want to give about the level of protection that occurs at Devoe or does not occur? Yeah, we, we don't really know why they are there. And I think perhaps Mena's uh, work tracking them and and I, I mean I guess I do have a hunch I think it's partly the Ace Basin is an incredible foraging area uh, or just the entire south coast is is a great foraging area and then DeVoe is a safe place to spend the night it's far enough out 
that owls won't bother them, uh, surrounded by water, so we don't have all the mammalian predators. So maybe just a combination of wonderful salt marshes that we've been talking about today and a, a safe place to, to spend the night. Yeah, and, uh, and keep in mind that because of our large tidal amplitude here, that's why we have such expansive salt marshes um, as well. So wimbrels can be feeding 10, 15 miles from the ocean and they're still in salt marsh. Um, and other part of the question was, has there been any talk about using the uh, acoustic sensors uh, to detect these birds? It's been used with songbirds. I don't know anything about use with shorebirds. Yeah, we have not. We haven't explored that. I, I'm not sure how useful it would be. I, I can't answer that one. <laughs> yeah, one thing about shorebirds, they come over in big flocks, so uh, it's hard to detect numbers within a, a flock compared to having songbirds who migrate uh, as single individuals coming over where you can pick up you know, individual call notes, uh, which is being used elsewhere. Yeah, we have uh, we have we are we have explored a little bit with radar, X-red radar, or just uh, radar to it. Well, we know we can, that can pick up birds, so that might be another tool to try to count how many birds are coming to devote. Okay, well, thank you again, Felicia. That was a a great way to end our uh, set of presentations.